check check in from me. Um, uh, Tabohu, you can hear me clearly. I can hear you, Prof. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Welcome uh, to the tenth uh, presidential roundtable uh, of the Academy of Science of South Africa, or ASIF, as we call it. And um, it is a great privilege to have so many of you signed up. Uh, and uh, we look forward to seeing even more of you come on in the course of the next few minutes. The uh, presidential roundtables have a very single, uh, singular purpose, and that is to draw attention of the public to pressing issues of concern to the academy, first of all, uh, by which I mean our public higher education institutions, but secondly also to the broader uh, 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 citizens who have an interest, obviously, in science and society broadly defined. Um, we have our topics like climate change, uh, the international rankings of universities, uh, academic xenophobia was our last uh, topic, which will shortly appear in summary form, thanks to one of our colleagues at UKZN in the South African Journal of science, a summary of the last roundtable discussion. So here we are today on a very sad and yet very significant uh, topic, which is the threat to leadership in South African universities. Now, um, I think it is completely appropriate and necessary to start with a roll call of some of the people who have been uh, killed on and around South African university campuses in recent times. I'll start with Professor Gregory Kamwendo, the Dean of Arts at the University of Zululand. Um, then Professor Mohammed Saber Tayob, a CA Associate Professor at the University of Limpopo. Then Pietrus Ruiz, who was the Head of Fleet Management at the University of Fort Hare. And then, of course, this year, the security uh, 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 guard and employee of the University of Fort Hare, somebody who was charged with taking care of um, uh, Mbunele Fisele, taking care of Professor Sakele Bushlungu. These are just four people that we know of. I have absolutely no doubt that there are other uh, staff, professors, academics, admin staff who've been assaulted, that I know for a fact, on different campuses, uh, and who have been sadly uh, maimed, if not also murdered. This is unbelievable in the context of higher education, and yet so common in our country as a whole. So we brought together four uh, really distinguished commentators, thinkers, intellectuals, academics, researchers, in higher education who uh, have been, who think about these things uh, and, and give us clarity when we are confused, who give us hope when we're sad, but give us analysis when we're confused. And, and, and so I'm absolutely delighted that we have, uh, uh, I see now four uh, colleagues here, I see Professor Habib, Adam Habib has joined us as well from, uh, uh, London, so that is fantastic. Um, and I'm going to uh, ask each of the speakers to speak for uh, 10 minutes to give us a sense of what they see, what they hear, what they feel, and what they fear, what they know about the crisis engulfing leadership in universities in South Africa today, with particular reference, obviously, to the assault on staff in, our, uh, in, in higher education. So I'm going to start with some brief comments, first of all, by uh, uh, Temba Musia, Professor Temba Musia, who, as you know, has been a leader in higher education administration across the board, uh, and as vice chancellor, as uh, the chair of the Council on Higher Education, uh, currently independent assessor at UNISA. So he can speak with some authority about the state of leadership and the threats it faces in IED. Prof. Musia Temba, over to you.
I can't mm -hmm. hear. I, well, there you go. Uh, I couldn't unmute, but thank you. I'm, I think I'm, I'm unmuted now. Yes. Um, thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor Johnson and colleagues. Good morning. Um, this is indeed a very uh, important uh, topic that us has uh, has assigned that we 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 address. And and yes, um, just to to go very quickly through some of the issues. Um, I, I truly believe that, uh, I mean, and we know this, that uh, we have a history of violence uh, in our country with very minimal consequences uh, to, to these acts of atrocities. And, and these violent protests historically really has been, you know, um, directed at management by students. And, and we see a different phenomenon now. And, and of course, the reluctance of the police to, to act decisively, uh, especially when there are protests. I've observed uh, the South African police, you know, uh, you know, negotiating with students. They, they, they probably believe they can negotiate better than management, but uh, it, it's very difficult. But uh, I personally, you know, have experiences, you know, uh, like really something I didn't read in a book or watch in a movie or something of numerous threats and violation of human rights of my personal mm -hmm. rights uh, being held at gunpoint, you know, on campus and petrol bombed, you know, a car getting vandalized like it was in a war zone and, you know, uh, all kinds of things. I mean, you know, I, I had bodyguards or protection services for three and a half years. And, and at the time, uh, many of our co co colleagues, you know, believed that, uh, you know, these people are just staging it. The three of us at the top uh, management had to do that. But one of the very interesting twists is how the media, you know, uh, you know, twist things and, and create even you know, further problems for, for university leaders, uh, sensationalizing very serious issues. And, and I will not refer to the fees must fall issues and so forth, because for me, the fees must fall were just very one drop in the ocean. I've seen too many of these violent uh, activities. And, but why is this happening? You know, well, we believe that it is a scramble for the meager resources that uh, universities have, particularly the infrastructure and efficiency grants, and, and several other resources, as you put there, like you know, taxi drivers and other, other people. But it's much more than that. And, and I think it's because our economy has been, you know, declining for quite a while and uh, corruption at universities is pervasive. Uh, people are very sophisticated when they do these kind of things. And, and I think unless we have very sophisticated IT surveillance, uh, we will continue to, to, to have these issues. Um, and of course, um, I think, I mean, higher education is just a reflection of a state that has failed itself and, 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 and its citizens. Uh, we were caught napping, blinded by the euphoria of democracy and neglected to ensure basic human rights are protected. You know, like the right to life. Many people have lost lives. And, you know, two security guards were killed uh, at my university a while back. And uh, the top three people, you know, we were under threat and we had to have bodyguards. So we have this demise really as well in institutions of uh, the traditional loyalty that we knew, uh, people are looking for kickbacks and stuff like that. So people are daring. Uh, and, and what does the government do? It's not enough, of course, uh, the protection. We know that uh, we have been in a honeymoon state that has dragged longer than, than is necessary. And, and the criminality, you know, is just so pervasive. And in many aspects of our lives, police are helpless, private security, is there, but it's profit driven. And uh, the university itself, you know, for many of us who have decided to hang around, you know, for the public good, you know, it has changed dramatically. It's not what we, we have known it to be. And, and I say to colleagues many times, it's safer to be in the taxi industry than to be in the upper echelons of a university. You know, this is a feature we never anticipated. It's like having a foreign, uh, you know, object in your shoe. There's no moment that passes without you feeling it. So, and then I think rhetoric is not action. Condemnation is not enough. And uh, the unspoken truth, really, I think, uh, uh, Professor Johnson and colleagues, 
is that uh, so many things happen. We know that uh, gender-based violence and femicide, you know, permeates through even at universities. And, um, and, and we only as a country really, I think South Africa is the only country in the world where criminals are so nurtured in you know, the justice system. There's no deterrence, no serious punishment. Perpetrators are repeat offenders. They are just fearless, they're daring, and you can just see what they do across, uh, accosting our students, mugging them, you know, all sorts of things. So we, we really live in a country where the state is also governed by fear. The example in Gauteng and, and, uh, and, and KZN, um, last, uh, you know, in July, the other year, uh, is, 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 you know, it's just there, it's still fresh in our minds. And where to from here, what do we do? You know, we need to protect ourselves. We need to approve the molds that work with external forces within our campuses. And, and you know, an intentional protection of our information. You know, people, you know, in the interest of, you know, transparency and everything, people have information that they shouldn't be having at universities. And I think safety and security, of course, is also very important. Uh, campaigns, and, but also the intelligence, you know, of how we can get around these things. And, uh, and, and one of the things that I know is very controversial for universities is that, uh, you know, we protect our autonomy, but we need to shift these resources to be handled differently by, by other institutions so that we protect lives because people's lives are, are in danger. This thing is serious, you know, um, and, and we cannot just uh, talk about it. We need to take actions and think out of the box. And, and in conclusion, Chair, I think we need to fix South Africa. I don't know who will do it, uh, but the reality is staring us in our faces. We need to fix universities. We need to protect confidential information. Universities have become what we have not known them to be when we decided to become university people. And uh, we're drifting from our purpose. I look at competition, I look at the media, I look at all kinds of things that are happening. And, and you know, good publicity should come from our students and communities to say about the service that we do and, and, and also our impact in research and the changes in the world. Not what we see uh, lately. We see that, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's more fashionable you know, for university leaders, you know, not to be selected on merit. Uh, there are lobbies, there are supporters. You can be holding to people that put in office. So our hiring practices are really porous. And uh, I, will, I will pause there because we really need to look into principles for our leadership and the kinds of things that are happening for leaders that are bold and trying to, to, to get out of this uh, corruption, you know, the threat to your lives and property is for real. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Thank you so much, Timber. A future we never anticipated. What a powerful statement. And thank you for sticking within the time. Adam, can I go to you now? Um, uh, all of you would know Professor Adam Abib, who is the... Um, Vice Chancellor at Wits University before he left to direct the prestigious School for Oriental and African Studies at the University of London, and um, is of course the author of many books, including Rebels and the Rage. Adam, if you're there, could you come on, please? Okay, can you hear me? Clearly. Uh Thank you very, very much. Uh, and thank you for uh, Timber's comments. I think it is uh, particularly useful. I don't, I'm probably going to speak along the same lines. I'm probably going to say very, very similar things, uh, perhaps with a slightly different flavor and perhaps with a slightly different emphasis. I think Timber raises uh, three sets of issues that I think need to be posed. The first is uh, the structural character of, of the violence on our campuses, that there is a deep-seated inequality in our society, that deep-seated inequality is pervasive in higher education. And the problem is that deep-seated uh, inequality in higher education has created 
a scramble for resources that the universities have. I think it's worth saying that we should be conscious that the problem is not all of the same gravity from campus to campus. Where Jonathan is in Stellenbosch, they do have challenges, there is corruption, there are threats, but they're not as substantive. They're not as life-threatening as we would have in Forte or Zululand and other things. And so I think that there is a worth recognizing that. And that's because the very character of inequality manifests in different ways. And then when you go to Forte, really it is the largest employer in Alice. And you need to understand that and you need to understand the consequences of resource flows in Alice and Forte's role in that. And I think that that inequality is something that we need to be cognizant of. I will add one perhaps provocative thing. And that is in the post 2017 settlement around the fees must fall, we've begun to move billions of additional 30, 40 billion a year into universities, largely through the funding of students. A vast majority of that has gone to the poorest of our institutions because that's where the poorest students are located. But that's aggravated this scramble for resources. And I do want to ask a broader question, which is not related to this. What is the net effect? What has been the net benefit? Can we truly say those universities are better, producing better output? And that's for a separate conversation. Because if it's not, if it is, then we can say we're on the, word to re on the way to recover. If it's not, we're going to ask what is the consequence of this kind of deployment of resources with no benefit? Uh, and I pose that as a very, very difficult question that we need to, to, to grapple with. But the first is the structure. The second is the complacency about violence. I think again, Tim Wells touched on this. Um, and the reason the violence continues is because we have a selective interpretation of violence where the violence is something we don't like. It's perpetrated against uh, people we know. We get very angry and condemn it where the violence is perpetrated by people who we ideologically agree with, we tend to be indulgent. Let's be honest. Uh, uh, much of the violence in universities comes from political actors. And many of those student actors are attached to student political parties. And many of those student political parties are attached to parliamentary political parties who are connected to parliamentarians. I can list the numbers. In fact, some of the people who were violent are sitting in parliament today. They've been rewarded. And in fact, some of them are sitting in the portfolio communities, community, committees responsible for education itself and higher education itself. So don't say we're against violence. We don't like it when we reward it in such uh, substantive terms. Uh, but it's not only student leaders. Our academics indulge it. Come and read, and I will reference you re reading material from progressive academics who will not condemn violence, who in fact excuse it, who say and target management, who will misrepresent the empirical evidence because it suits their political conclusions, who see violence because it's a necessary struggle against the force of neoliberalism. And I can quote those people. And you and I know who they are. And we don't call it out. So that's the second. Academics, progressive, who are refusing to, to do that, who indulge it. Third is union leaders who are complicit in this and have been involved in it. And fourth are commentators, public, uh, journalists, all of whom go and read the reading material on Fees Must Fall. Go and engage it and see the very people who condemn violence have indulged it. We've got NGOs, legal NGOs who are 
meant to defend these things who were complicit about it. So I worry about a hypocritical discourse. So we all get very concerned when somebody tries to assassinate a vice chancellor. But the very acts that build up to that, we don't condemn in as vocally and loudly as it needs to be. And so I put that as the second thing. So if there's going to be a conversation, Jonathan, we need an honest conversation. And we need about the issue of police paralysis, we know that, the incompetence of the police force, the issues of how detectives and all of that have been denuded in the police force, the incompetence of the leadership of the police services. But more than that, we need to deal with both the structural and the complicity and indulgence of violence by a whole series of actors who should know better. And I just want to stop there because I think that that, I, I'm not saying anything different from what Temba is, but I'm perhaps putting it boldly and much more crudely because I do think we need to talk, talk about it. I'll stop there, thank you. Adam, thank you very much. And, and, and once again, for putting your finger on, uh, on, 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 on the problem here that uh, we don't, not all violence is the same <laughs> in the perception and in the assessments that we make. I think that's a very powerful point. Thank you. I'm going to um, uh, go to uh, uh, Professor Nomalanga Makize, who's a historian at Nelson Mandela University, uh, MA from Rhodes, doctorate from UCT, and one of the rising stars, dare I say, uh, uh, in in the International Academy, and uh, Nomalanga's work is on African vernacular histories, historiography, and the like. Uh, Professor Makize, a pleasure to have you. Over to you, ma'am. It's that unmute button now. Uh, can we help there, Renata or Tabocha? Assuming it's on our side. Ah, there you are. Okay. okay. Oh, <laughs> hi, hi, colleagues. Um, would have been much better for us to be able to meet face to face because then we could really have uh, debates, uh, uh, but also start thinking, uh, as, as Adam is saying, more honestly and, and, and have the disagreements, uh, but that are leading towards purposeful um, something. Uh, and I think what we need, <laughs> first of all, let me just say that um, I don't think it's an accident that the two people, uh, the most senior people that have been murdered uh, um, are people from the humanities. I don't think so. I don't think it's an accident that it was Kamwendo and that it's, uh, sorry, uh, of course he hasn't yet, <laughs> oh my God, Gutlung is still with us, but that it's it's a particular kind of academic that rises into leadership that um, uh, that that tackles the kinds of structural problems that we see in a particular way. And I'm not saying that our colleagues in the sciences are not uh, facing similar pressures, but um, there is a, there is a, there is, a, and I think I, I, we must just think about this, Adam, uh, Salim, uh, Prof. Temba, all of us, Jonathan, that <laughs> there, we, when we're look, looking at the internal system right now and the kind of uh, leadership that's being bred and rewarded in higher education, that tends to default far more to technocraticism towards career pathing, the career tracking. Like I am definitely, I, I, I mean, I'm not a rising star because you can imagine as a like a, as a as a full blown humanities person, I'm I'm so like I I I don't want to be that that way. I I just want to think about the academic project for the country as a whole, and I think that's the problem. I mean, if you ask ourselves, Adam, you spoke about violence and the fact that. Um, we are, we are, we are accepting different, we are, we are having different standards for the violence. I agree with you. And I agree, even though I have differences in my, my agreement with you, we can't get into those now. Um, and I think one of the core problems that we face, and perhaps it's something for the older cohort of vice chancellors to think about is, but what are these universities offering society in the first place, right? What's the cultural project of our institutions? 
somewhere uh, in the transition between you know the end of apartheid and the coming of this corporatization that all of you seem to have been happy with um we've lost the academic project you know you've all become super vice chancellors and you know you all had these perks and i mean guys you could have been more critical you could have been more critical about that um that's that 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 thing that was being brought in that you understood to be a problem. Now the thing is, fortunately for us, even as this corporatization was coming in and, and according all this power to executive management and then creating more aggressive cultures in institutions. So trade unions suddenly become more aggressive, student bodies uh, become more aggressive. Now you've got a brutal culture in institutions. We've had a, a time when our vice chancellors were intellectuals. <laughs> so they, they, they could still wield that power and, and, and the brutal culture, deal with it by just being intellectuals. Uh, the, the era of the intellectual vice chancellor is gone, Salim. It's gone. <laughs> we don't have intellectual vice chancellors anymore. They're gone. They don't see themselves as intellectual leaders. They are Instagram stars or they are, you know, gods on campus. How are those people going to deal with this reality? It's not a surprise that it was Gregory and it was Sakela that have faced the most violent uh, threats in the sense and also provided the strongest resistance. So all this um, comes down to well, what are we offering society as these universities? Let me just say that the, I think that that degradation of the academic project in South Africa is real and it's in the hands of range of actors. It's in the hands of academics and our incentives based things. Why are you guys still allowing performance management to, to dominate universities? It turns academics into uncaring people. It turns academics into people who disinvest. Now you want to cry about, oh, you know, why are you allowing performance management systems? I mean, University of Pretoria, notorious, notorious. You've shifted from apartheid into super corporatism. How are academics supposed to care about culture and life and norms and ethics? And we don't care. So I think that's what the, 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 the humanities have been trying to put on the table, but we've been, you know, and when, when we see a lot when academics from the humanities, some, and also, you know, from education and related sort of disciplines, when they arise, you, when you get at least intellectual leadership in institutions, then you start to see that a university is meant to be a university. And I know Zakhen is a difficult guy, very difficult guy. I'm not surprised <laughs> he's trained to be difficult apart from being a, a you know sort of a, a, a black intellectual we're trained to be difficult and it's when the difficult people come in suddenly these institutions which are now career driven no malanga oh no one wants to touch her no man so um i just want the colleagues who are especially in the sciences um the, the natural sciences who seem to be a little bit divorced from these cultures of the of the of, of the university where we, we we hold each other accountable through discourse through you know trusting that we can cooperate in a cultural project together where we don't have to agree I don't have to agree with Adam at all I just want to be able to be robustly engaged with him and for him to be able to call out certain things so Adam can say no look you don't want to talk about the problem of fees must fall I will put it on the table and not have this like, oh, you know, mm, mm. no, that's not a university. So I think the academic project, the cultural project, the intellectual project has been completely derailed. Um, Prof. Janssen, I think what, what should give us hope um, is this. We've seen this pattern everywhere, not just the, the, the current pattern. We know this pattern of the scattering of intellectuals from uh, the broader history of the post-colony in Africa. We know that this is what happens. Now, when black people come to power, they fight. <laughs> okay, let's be clear. When black people come to power, they fight. This is the fight, okay? This is the fight. And by the way, Adam, this is why many black academics did not take the line of the white liberals in the institutions. We took the liberation line, which is we agree, but we don't agree on your norms. We agree with the struggle you are putting forward and it's not new, but we don't agree with your methodology. Um, and many black academics, myself and others, uh, you all, you know, were maligned for just disagreeing with students while our white liberal colleagues clapped every time they burned something and threw, tear, uh, you know, threw things into computer labs and uh, workers died and nobody would hold students accountable. Black people don't, don't do that. Um, but we know the post-colonial pattern when black people take up power in the post-colony, 
that take up creates that scramble for resources. I like that we've seen this pattern before. The question for us in South Africa now is as this pattern unfolds here, if we accept this is not exceptional, we are also black, we're also African, it's not exceptional. So um, let's think about that then. India, Latin America, we've seen this, we've seen this, it's not new, therefore it's universally understandable, therefore, we can make decisions about how to deal with it. We can make, uh, we can study this problem and begin to do away with the corrosive nature of the, 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 the power struggles that emerge as new classes of black people, new management, new trade unions, new academics, new professoriate, all fighting for the position. That transition that we, we fully understand is what has happened to Fort Hay and everywhere. So we have to get back then to that fundamental question. What is the university supposed to offer society? What's the cultural purpose, right? Um, and I know, Salim, that that's the question that we always had at the heart of what we did at Rhodes. And I'll conclude by saying, um, for some reason, people were surprised at how combative we can be, uh, Salim. And I was like, because even when I was 26, Salim didn't find it insulting that we used to engage. He didn't find it a problem. He was the vice chancellor. He'd be combative. I'd be combative as a junior lecturer. And that's why there was an intellectual life. And I wonder how we're supposed to think about getting back to that under these conditions. Thank you very much, Nomalanga. Very powerful points. Uh, I particularly like the one about this, what you call the brutal culture that doesn't emerge out of thin air. It emerges out of this corporatization of the university and the kinds of things that we have been permissive about. Thank you so much for those inputs. Uh, Salim, you have the last word on the panel. Welcome. Uh, uh, all of you would know Professor Salim Badat, who is now the research professor in the humanities at UKZN, but of course, uh, uh, distinguished himself um, as the Vice Chancellor of Rhodes University, and then of course was also um, the Director of International Higher Ed at the Mellon Foundation in New York. Good to have you, uh, Salim. Thank you, Jonathan. Good morning, and thanks for the invite to contribute to this webinar. And let me just begin with my condolences to the family of Mbunesi Vesele. And let me too recognize what I think is the courageous leadership of Vice Chancellor Bushlungu and his determination to restore the inter intellectual and institutional integrity, I think, of Fort Hare. And as you've mentioned, this is not uh, the first acts of violence. And these are indeed, I think, dangerous times for university leadership. So let me engage your question. Um, firstly, why is this happening? I can see at least five reasons. First, as others have said, I think it reflects the morbidity of the general political economy of South Africa. And I think this is an important point to make. Far from being ivory towers, our universities are extensively implicated with the rest of society, locally, regionally, and nationally. And individuals and syndicates have captured, as we know, various public institutions. And why? Because we have a dithering state, because we have collusion between criminals and political officials, and because we have a lack of leadership and management capacities and alike. And some of the reasons for that, we are. We understand. And these individuals and syndicates will besmirch, they'll intimidate, and they'll kill anyone who gets in their way. So, unlike uh, Temba, no, I don't think uh, universities command paltry resources. Universities command tens of billions in resources and are fair game for these hoodlums. At universities, the precious resources are certainly financial, which become the objects of theft, fraud, tender scams, and the like. We know that. But, but there are also invaluable resources of a different kind at universities, which are distinctive to universities. And what do I mean by that? I mean access to financial aid, admissions to universities, and especially to certain degree programs, award of degrees, conferral of status, like professorships, which everyone seems to be scrambling for without wanting to put in the work. Honorary doctorates, I bet some of those are being sold. All of these have great currency at our universities. And these things that I'm mentioning are life-changing 
for those who are desperate for paydays at any cost, irrespective of ethics, morality, and legality, and so on. So corruption around financial aid, NISFAS, around places at universities for those who do, don't meet admission requirements, degrees that are being award, awarded fraudulently, plagiarism, publishing in predator journals, unscrupulous external examining, and peer review, and dubious awards of honorary doctorates. That's also what uh, is at stake here. Second, those who lead and manage higher education in South Africa, government and state officials, the leadership of universities individually and collectively are not blameless. Nomalanga is absolutely right. The complicity and the collusion on the part of leadership is legendary. In my view, criminality, fraud, nepotism, and corruption thrive institutionally when A, government and state officials provide platitudes rather than effective steering and sensible policy interventions. B, when there's a lack of ethical and effective leadership by university councils and senates, by leaders and managers, which is then compounded by what Nomalanga is speaking about, the lack of institutional capacity and the personal capabilities to lead and govern and manage. We think anyone can run universities. And the fault there is councils, who I don't think have an understanding of what a university is and what kind of people you need to run a university. Thirdly, there are constituencies and actors, as Adam says, at universities, including academics, who conduct themselves in the most reprehensible and dubious ways. And they effectively become complicit through the acts of commission, but especially the acts of omission. Where are you senates of universities? And then there's an arrogant lack of accountability that runs through our universities, and we know it runs through our state and government. All of these, I want to suggest, corrode the fundamental purpose and functions of universities and the critical roles that they can play in a society like ours that has huge, huge challenges. Third, as has been mentioned, the hoodlums within and outside universities act with impunity, not only because institutional conditions facilitate this, but also because there are not many repercussions, given weak and tardy policing and prosecuting. Fourth, there is a conspiracy of public silence as an effect either of complicity or fear, and it's right to be fearful, given the consequences for those who whistleblow. Fifth, the political leadership has failed to cultivate any strong sense of the critical value of our universities. If anything, the anti-intellectualism of those in power manifested most dramatically, only the most dramatic by Jacob Zuma, makes our universities fair games for charlatans and the corrupt. So second question, is government doing enough to support university staff? No, as usual, a Niagara of rhetoric and a Sahara of consistent concerted action right from the top. We have ministers who are full of platitudes, full of rhetoric, but dismally fail in doing their job as ministers. And so while we must insist that the state and universities do all they can to keep academics and ministers safe, there's also a limit to what any state and especially a weak, weak state like the kind we have can do. Ultimately, and I'm not saying we have to wait for them, ultimately, you need a ruling party with an impeccable morality that is not mired in scandals and corruption like ours is. We need a capable government. We need an effective and development state. And we need an impeccable public morality, none of which we have, and which have to be restored and rebuilt. And I just want to suggest that we need to be careful. In the present climate, there's a danger of proposing quick fix solutions that could be of doubtful efficacy. We must also be extremely cautious that our proposals do not further securitize our universities in unfortunate ways, because that will severely compromise the sociality of learning and knowledge making and contact and communication between universities, leaders, and other constituencies. I wish I could say, share some photographs of you of the departments of sociology and political studies at one university and the iron bars and the gates and so on. 
What does that do to how we ontologically construct students? What does that do to learning when these bars confront you? Let me just add, beyond protection from violence, the state has also failed to protect more generally the well-being of academics because of its limited capacity and its ineffective use of instruments of planning, funding, and quality assurance to steer higher education university. What do I mean by that? Almost three out of five academics in South Africa today are contract staff. Three out of five, with all the negative consequences that go, both for academics who are getting burnt out and for students in terms of the quality they receive. Some troubling developments at universities are related directly to the chase for third stream income in the face of inadequate state funding. And I'm starting to learn some of our universities are hungry universities. It seems like no amount of money is going to satisfy them, like the Harvards and Oxfords and so on. The perversions that Nomalanga hints at, let's talk about that. The perversions of plagiarism, publishing in predator journals, the discontenting award of degrees despite dubious, doubtful student abilities have to do with both how the ministry funds research and how universities have incentivized and monetized research. It's not only the state. It is a corporate uh, leadership of our universities. It is not contribution to knowledge and the quality of research that is valued. It is a subsidy for the university shared in various ways with individual academics. That's the holy grail not knowledge. It's if the input subsidy is a chase for bums on seat, the output subsidy is the catalyst of other perversities. All of this have an incredibly corrosive effect on knowledge and quality. This funding regime has to change. It must change. So what do these attacks mean? Some of you know, I think Jonathan, we spoke about this. Some of you know that I gave serious thought to leaving Rhodes as vice chancellor to avail myself to lead one of our new universities. How do you resist the incredible adventure of building a university from scratch? Ultimately, as, I, as you know, I did not pursue the possibility. I valued my body and life in the face of hoodlums who were salivating at the prospect of getting their grubby hands on the massive resources involved in building a university. Who wants the intrusion of bodyguards 24 7, 365? Vice Chancellorship is challenging, it's demanding without having to worry about life, limb, or family who are protecting the integrity of your institution. So who's gonna be willing to lead our university? How will Vice Chancellors lead without fear or favor? If capable candidates shun leadership, the consequences of for our universities are calamitous. So what we are talking about has much wider ramifications, I think, Jonathan, and we need to start getting real about the conditions that have been created by the state, by also collusion and complicity on the part of universities. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lim. Very powerful ending there to, to, to the panel. I just want to pick up where before I open up uh, to the um, uh, to the to the audience, uh, I just want to pick up a, a very important point that uh, Salim mentioned and that uh, Nomalanga, if you guys don't mind, I'm just going to call you on your first names and not complicate yeah. things here. Um, and Nomalanga's uh, uh, inference as well. It's just, you know when 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 I was asked to to go <laughs> uh, rescue. Uh, Mangasutu University of Technology, I remember very clearly uh, an existential crisis for myself when the minister, Mr. Pando at the time, said, no, you will get bodyguards. And the thing that struck me, you know, was that the idea of a university is inimical. It's the opposite of, it stands in contradiction to this notion of being secured, you know, by men with, with submachine guns. And 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 the question, of course, in the current current crisis is uh, Salim and Nomalanga and Temba Adam. How does one do both? How does one, on the one hand, not want to lose a valued colleague, and at the same time, not want to communicate the message to the university community 
that a university is a place in which, as you put it, Salim, you have bars and you know high ceilings and 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 security guards. It just seems to me there's something else lost in the fire here, if you know what I mean. Uh, anybody want to comment on that? Adam. I think I think that it's a lovely question because it it was something that I had uh, made a comment and had written a comment both with, with Nomalanga and Salim spoke and both spoke powerfully about the corporatization of the university over the last 30 years perhaps 35 years and that frankly is not a national project but it is a global uh, problem uh, and, and both pose the question that a lot of the challenges we're talking about is the corporatization and how do you manage it? Uh, and, and I think that it's a powerful question. And I think that your next webinar should be about how do we think through moving out of that? But it poses a second question, which is what I think you touch on, is this is the change and the turnaround of universities is not going to be a textbook one. We're not going to fix the structure of the country, fix the policy architecture, and then the universities will change. That's not how change happens anywhere. Change happens in a much more messy way. And so when you say don't securitize, when uh, Salim poses the question, don't securitize the university because of its impact on the learning process is right. But on the other hand, you can't say, uh, uh, Sakele should not have bodyguards because if he doesn't have bodyguards, he'll be killed. And so you've got to strike the balance in the messiness of life and in the messiness of turnarounds between how do you get the right balance between security interventions, but not go over the top so it irreparably damages the, the project. And that's the every vice chancellor and every leadership in universities have had to confront this over the 15 years. When somebody's burning and threatening to burn a building, a lot of people say, no, don't bring the police in. What do you want us to do? Let the place burn. It, you can't say, they're in the messiness of life. You've got to strike the right balance between those security measures that protect life, that protect property, but that doesn't go over the top and then use the space that opens up to then intervene in ways that, that allow for uh, the, the university project not to be compromised. And that's done at an institutional level, but it also has to be done at the state level. Uh, and so my worry about this debate and the way it's being posed is it's too polarized. The world is either we change the structural conditions and then we fix this. The messiness of life is going to require the balance and so Pan, Minister Panda was right. You know, when we send uh, Jonathan Jansen to MT, MUT, we have to provide him with bodyguards because knowing Jonathan and knowing that he's going to call and say things, he may get killed. So we have to protect him while we create the conditions that open it up. And that's the messiness that we don't confront. And that's the messiness no, no, that, that I think is the real heart of the humanities project. Transition and change happens in the real heart of that. How do you strike the balance between competing priorities? And that frankly, progressive social scientists have not understood in South Africa because they see the world in capitalism versus socialism, black horses fight. Uh, uh, this, it's too neat. And transitions are very much about how do you structure the balance of competing priorities in a real life struggle? Hmm. Stop. So, so let me come in with that and slightly disagree. Okay, so let me... So, no, Adam, I don't think Nomalanga and I or anyone else is saying we first sort the social structure and then we sort out the conjuncture and then we'll come to universities. That's not how change happens. Things have to happen simultaneously, right? So it's not about do we do this first and then do we do what I think both of us would be saying is that we have to recognize we have very powerful political and social dilemmas lives are cost you, but we have to really think carefully about what trade offs we're going to make in terms of balancing these different imperatives and priorities. 
because you can be no doubt when you securitize in certain ways and you have bodyguards around you and so on, it's going to impact the academic project, right? So it's not either or. It's how in this messiness you force the correct strategies and interventions and you consciously think about that. So here's to be glib, one of my concerns. Absolutely, Sakele needs uh, bodyguards. Maybe Jonathan needs the bodyguards at MUT and so on. But here's my fear. Apart from that, the next thing is going to be having two uh, seven series BMWs at the front and two at the back and the green and blue lights and so on. Because some of our leadership is that vain, I think, in our universities, right? It's what you start unrolling. And then you forget why you did this and so on. So it's about how do we have these debates democratically and where the senates in these discussions, because they are meant to be leading the university's academic project. How do they hold vice chancellors accountable? Academics and senates have basically rolled over and allowed vice chancellors incredible powers that vice chancellors should not have, right? So I think it's about how we debate these things openly and publicly and how we forge the interventions in the most sensible ways in these difficult dilemmas and so on. It's not either or, I agree. Thanks very much. I think you guys agreed, yes, indeed. Uh, Timba, sorry, uh, you had your hand up. Thank you, uh, Professor Johnson. Uh, colleagues, you know, I, I think I, I take all the points that are made here, and, and they're in fact true. Look at it at different angles. And, and, and my view really is a very pragmatic one, because as I said in my, my remarks, I have experienced too many things in this sector, like real experience. I didn't read about them. Uh, you you make mention of uh, Gregory Camwendo, Professor Johnson, in the mm. book. It started way before that. I was I was at Zulian doing an assessment there with Professor Africa, when a very large man stood before us, and I remember the woman who was with us assisting us was so traumatized. A very large fellow stood before us. Um, and lifted his shirt and showed us three bullets on his stomach that they shot me here and there and there. And that traumatized the knees very badly. So this, this violence uh, on campuses because of projects and all kinds of things is for real. When, when, when we asked the minister to appoint uh, Anthony Mel, because, you know, Anton is a peacemaker and, you know, he can get around. It eventually turned out to be Chris de Beer, who is a hard-nosed legal person, you know, he did the kind of things. I discovered those certificates there in three piles that were being sold. And he just took the, the work further. But the point I'm making is the issue of security on campus. You, you don't just look at it from protecting your leaders, students as well. Students are very vulnerable. The kinds of things that are happening to our students these days, I mean, are very horrific. So the whole concept of security and safety is something that we need to take seriously. And, and, and I understand the, the issue around intellectualization and everything. That's what you need. That's what the university is for. But the lived experience, teach us that uh, you cannot have your students on campus and, and, and your students are under threat and students die. And I'm not talking about mental health and all of these other challenges. I'm, I'm talking about criminals who, who do what they do uh, because of uh, little cell phones and things like that. But, uh, and then, then you go to leadership. Yes, indeed, we have a crisis, as I said. We look around, those of us who have been around, who have been taught by some of the best, you know, or who have learned from some of the best. And, and you look around, you just wonder, like, what's happening here? You know, and, um, and, and, and competent leaders are no longer interested to take up these jobs. You see them, they're just not interested. They do other things. So it's a very, very serious problem that we have. And, and Adam touched on, on aspects of it that, uh, you know, and, and we know that it's pervasive, you know. 
I've been yeah. to government 11 and a half years, I've been going to that portfolio committee. And, and I can tell you that uh, there was only one very special, very good chairperson. And uh, for the rest of it, it's about accountability and harassment and also. So it cuts through, you know, when we look at students now, you know, some of them at other institutions, we look at leaders. So what I'm saying is the issue of security is for real, you know? Yeah. Thank you. No, no thank you, Temba. I'm going to read to you as a panel uh, two questions, comments from the chat. But before I do that, uh, I'd like to just give Nomalanga a uh, uh, time to respond to this round. Yeah, so, so, sorry, this is why I wish we were face-to-face, uh, -face, then maybe it would be, be talking. Uh, I, I, don't, I know it becomes awkward when the panelists start to dominate the Zoom. Um, I, I, I think that uh, for me, the question is what, what can we, we be doing then going forward? And I think we really need to meet. <laughs> Like Jonathan, like guys, we need to meet. Like we need to meet properly. Like this isn't, I can see Jimmy here. I can't even ask him questions. You know, uh, it's like, we need to meet. Can we please those with resources? Can you please enable us to meet? Um, because we need to redefine the, 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 the the discourse uh, or I got these academic words I'm even sad I have to have this conversation in English I'm tired of English I'm tired of this academic English it's it's a lie it's pointless so what we need is to take the lessons that we have so um you know Adam said the messiness and uh, this is what uh, you know we're all describing um um this messiness is the academic project of the post-colony it's the thing that led all our compatriots from other African countries to land up here right and even that one, uh, uh, Jonathan, when we when we unpack it, I, I haven't seen your thing on academic xenophobia, but I might disagree with some of it. Um, we've had waves of 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 the um, uh, migration of colleagues from uh, across the continent, where some of those uh, colleagues have been uh, very uh, structurally important for the Black project in South Africa. And then we found that uh, other colleagues have been part of the, the corrosion of the academic project by, by just virtue of how they've grafted into the system. And we need to discuss those things. And we need to talk about that messiness. It's the mess of Black ascension. It's of, of Black ascendancy or African ascendancy. What happens when new classes of Africans are moving up in the system in the post-colony? And universities are one avenue for that. That messiness, Adam, is 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 one thing that our white liberal colleagues don't understand, and it's the thing that that frustrates a lot of us um, <clears throat> when there's this, um, uh, you know, hyper liberalism about everything. And, and as as black people, we're like, ah, that's not what my mother said or my father or my grandfather. That's not how we do it. Um, but is this even allowed in the university? So so the the domination of of the academic discourse over 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 mess that 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 in many ways you need a very strongly rooted uh black and uh african and post-colonial wisdom to talk about what's happening in south africa so that's when we need that post-colonial intelligence to be here so that's the project the project is the post-colonial mess and 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 then yes, we can now live with knowing. Okay, guys, at points people need bodyguards. One of our colleagues, Jacobs, he was abducted there in Nigeria the other day. He was abducted, and he had to pay ransom. Okay, so what I'm saying is, can we find a way, please, uh, Professor Johnson? If you don't organize us, I will organize us. Then <laughs> I will then ask the other colleagues that let's organize us because we need to counteract this idea that the university has no project in South Africa. It, the entire project is the post-colonial mess. That's the entire project. How do you sort out the post-colony? So can we please, I want to meet the people I know here, I'm seeing them and I can't talk to them because it's it's Zoom. <laughs> so I will I will, I will will um, make the follow up then after this. Uh, uh, please organize us. I, I have 10 organized uh, events for academics this year alone, uh, precisely because of that need to be, but just to give you the reality to that. Uh, so we have a big post-colony discussion next month, March, sorry, uh, with colleagues from around the country, other parts of the world. But yes, the reality, I was scheduled to be at Fort Air to do interviews for one of our projects, you know, um, 
and I was advised not to come because you could get killed. Um, I'm and so on. So there's also that reality, but there's a real need that you feel and that I feel to, to talk. I want to be with colleagues. I want to look them in the eye, especially when one deals with matters of of, of life and death. Okay, so yes, two questions, comments, which I found very interesting. One is uh, by Girish uh, Kotwal, in which he references our dear friend and colleague Bongani Mayossi. And he's, uh, what he, he's really saying is, I mean, it's one thing to, sh to, to sh put bullets into a person in their car, but what about that enormous stress of the uncaring university, of, of not feeling appreciated, of the hostility of the people around you, about the other ways in which you, your, your demise comes about? Why are we not talking about the hidden costs of, 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 of violence? And I use the word more broadly. And then Andrew Mamela says also something very really interesting. Um, isn't part of this problem that when you open up the resources of the university for competitive tenders, for example, you bring in all the baddies, shouldn't we be insourcing some of this work, uh, in other words, using internal expertise? Now, again, uh, several of you have had to deal with these issues as, as university leaders. Uh, can I just put that out there, see if anybody wants to respond to either the case of Bongani or the question of insourcing expertise? Okay, while you guys are thinking about that, I'm told by Tabojo that some of our participants can't access the chat. So if any of you wish to uh, just uh, indicate, uh, those of you in the, I'll put it on gallery so that I can see whose hand is up, then feel free to ask a question directly to our panelists. In the meantime, Temba, do you want to respond? Yes, I do. Thank you. I mean, the issue of insourcing has got its history. Uh, we know uh, post this must fall. But uh, the point I, I, I make is that uh, why, why should universities be kept so busy with this huge amount of monies and to manage them, sometimes at the expense of uh, teaching and learning arrangements, we we were too busy. I mean, I look at some of the councils of universities. These are just business meetings, you know, talking about money, talking about this, there, and whatever, and so on. So on. The whole intellectual project, the essence of what the university is, is relegated to the bottom or is non existent at all. So, my, my view is that you have 20 billion, 30 billion, whatever the case may be, you know, let this be you know, executed by a different organization where you can have oversight as an institution and participate somewhat and not expose a vice chancellor or a registrar or anyone to this kind of danger. It should be removed from, focus on your research, focus on this, look for money where you're supposed to get it. And, and you know, these are very nice uh, boastful statements the government has so many billions for infrastructure given to this institution or, or for NSFAS and all of that. And, and in a state that is as uh, fearful as ours and the criminals are just thriving, they just go target day. Oh, there's money there, you know? So think of different ways in which you can remove the threat from university leadership. And, and manage it differently. But I know that academics and institutions will say, no, 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 we can do this. And, and I just don't think under the circumstances, we're just creating more and more problems for ourselves. And, and I'm not even talking about the competence of certain people to manage these resources. I'm not talking about people that are in these structures who have an eye on, on all of these things. We see these things, we know them, and very sophisticated. Mm -hmm. So we can insource as much as you want, but you're gonna have more problems. I can tell you that, <laughs> we see. Yeah. Thank you. I completely agree with that. If I may just throw my, uh, my scent in the purse. I think especially when it comes to large infrastructural grants, there are issues, uh, Timber, of competence, uh, capability rather. 
but there's also issues of, of corruption. I definitely think instead of putting that pressure on a vice chancellor and her or his team, you should really have experts doing this for you because it it's I mean it's 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 just the killing fields, especially around infrastructural projects, given the size, the magnum of the incoming funds. So I agree with that completely. Adam. Uh, so colleagues, I want to come back because I think this insourcing debate is a real one because it actually um, focuses the mind on the messiness of the transition. So I, I agree with both uh, Demba and yourself around the big infrastructural projects and you need expertise and etc. But insourcing is not only about that, it's about vulnerable workers in a university, uh, cleaners, security guards. Do you insource them? Do you leave that? as part. So let, let me sh demonstrate the messinesses of this. So in the Vitz case, when I was still vice chancellor, we under fees must fall, we, we were under pressure to, to bring in uh, insourced workers, both cleaners and, and uh, security staff. The real cost of doing so was 150 million rand. Um, and effectively, 150 million rand per annum had to be raised. We didn't have the money. So we went to each of the researchers and we said to them, what we would like to do is take your interest for two years, not your grants. As and where your donors would allow it, we want to take your interest for two years. And what we want to do is impose, in addition to that, a 6% cut on each department. And we paid for it. And that bought us two years, by which time the growth in the income effectively allowed us to absorb the cost of 150 million rand per annum. Now, I pose this because that's the messiness of the decision. So Salim earlier on said, seven, three quarters of our uh, academic staff are uh, effectively on contract. He's right. But actually, when we cut 6% of the budget of departments, we aggravated that problem of putting more academics on this. Now, the answer to this was, um, obviously, if the state made more resources available, then you could have absorbed it. So the very people the political parties that were arguing for insourcing of vulnerable workers, their principles were sitting in the state, not providing the resources for the very insourcing. So the net effect that there is that the executive in the institution had to make calls and they made to make a choice in that context between bringing in vulnerable workers. There was no question about the social justice value of that. And the cost of cutting the research and the departmental budgets to enable that to happen. And that's what happened. That's what I mean by the messiness of having to make trade-offs, real trade-offs with real costs to the project. Right. And that's what I mean. Every single decision in a university requires those choices between competing imperatives. And I think we need to understand that, we need to empower that, we need to surface that, and we need to internalize that meaning. And sometimes we make it right, and sometimes we get the decisions wrong, but that's what I mean. And that's what we gotta figure out in the complexity of this, of this issue. I want to- no, I, don't, um, I don't want to go on, sorry, John. I want, you know, I, don't, I think you probably want to move away from this, but just to declare, if we were having this debate in USAF and you were still a vice chancellor and Adam was and I was, I would be on the other side. I would be implacably, ideologically and practically and politically opposed to this talk of outsourcing. And let me declare that one of the first things I did when I got to Rhodes as vice chancellor, I signed a personal agreement to the unions that there shall be no outsourcing at Rhodes while I'm vice chancellor. And I will do it again if I was to become vice chancellor of Rhodes again, because this is where place and the institutional locations matter. You would destroy Makanda and probably in that process Rhodes if you tried to outsource at Rhodes. 
And I would not blame those workers because of the repercussions, right? And the idea that you get better services for the private sector, if you just outsource, I don't buy. What Rhodes has is a community. The Rhodes workers were probably amongst the best paid in South Africa. When UCT was shamefully paying their workers half what Rhodes was paying. Because we know how it happened, how our academics at UCT became the best paid salaries. Right? We know how it was done and who was crushed in that process. So, you know, while this are tempting, I would be implacably opposed about outsourcing. Okay, I want to shift a little bit, thanks, Salim, to, to, to the future of leadership. Uh, may I be bold here in suggesting to the four of you that the cupboard is bare when it comes to uh, 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 having a deep bench, as they say in sports, uh, with respect to university leadership. The cupboard is bare. We don't have people who have the scholarly credentials, first of all, uh, who have the management and leadership capability, and who have the political news to run a very complex institution called the university. Is there not the problem uh, I pose to, to you that given what's been happening in recent times, you know, a university vice chancellor punched on an elite campus, a university vice chancellor narrowly escaping death in a rural university, that we're going to get the wrong people applying, the wrong people uh, 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 appointed, uh, and, and people from the academic project is not at the top of the agenda, but basically, you know, keeping the university afloat and so on. Isn't there this danger that the messaging that goes out from particularly what happened around uh, uh, Sokela and his team makes the place unattractive for the kind of leadership that you really want. I just want to put that out boldly. Uh, uh, Nomalanga, you want to start us off? That's true. But now I almost feel like saying, well, since we've turned the system into this career, power grab, Instagram, you know, no, um, and there's a particular way that it's it's constructed for women as well. That you know, you it's this uh, it's 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 strange, but it's this new like non-intellectual but just career-driven you know female girl power thing that seems to be happening, which I don't like. Um, some of it is useful because I think women need I think women need their own spaces in 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 in, in being trained to be leaders, but we being uh, infiltrated by careerism and it's 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 girl careerism, you know. So so now it's you know having senior women uh, executives that not even call them leaders, you know, calling you aside and telling you how to dress. It's being told. Um, you know, you shouldn't offend people and um, uh, this this new kind of careerism. So if those women want to be those women, then, you know, career yourself up into this empty university then. And don't call me when the bullets fly. I feel like that, Jonathan. I'm like, okay, do that then. If you don't want to fight for the university and you don't want to uh, uh, be serious about the academic project and how we're going to protect this post-colonial situation, then go die <laughs> because uh, the rest of us are going to then just retreat and 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 do that thing that I say, which is academics just disinvest. And so I think I think um, uh, I think Jonathan, when us when we were engaging at the young professoriate or emerging uh, professoriate um, future professoriate, the the question was about that. It was about this cohort that's now my age, you know, sort of uh, late thirties, early forties. And, and whether we're capable. And sadly, we are not for many reasons. Um, and so you know what's who's moving in the system now? Um, Non-academic people going via now yeah. the, 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 the side of the university that can now accept an MBA. There's a yeah. university here, please be embarrassed by yourself. You put a dean of students with an MBA. How do you know that was a real MBA? They should be embarrassed at university. Im yeah, you should be embarrassed. You know who you are. Don't do these things. You are taking non-academic people who don't have the fiber, the fabric, the insight, the capacity, don't even know what teaching is, mm. and you're putting them in powerful positions. Then that person goes and gets a degree in management, a PhD in management. That person is my future vice chancellor. So I'm saying, Jonathan, if that's what you want, go and take the bullet. Don't call me. 
don't call me, leave me here. I don't mind teaching, it's a calling. Most of us teaching is a calling. We don't wanna come to your ex-co meetings. But if that's what people are going to be doing, though, this cohort of mine must stop this thing. We've got to stop it. That's why I challenge, I challenge that cohort of yours, uh, Jan, uh, Jonathan, that if we sit and we think that the career pathing is going to be a reward, oh no, it's not about to reward you. The best reward has come from investment in the academic project, in enabling proper academic trajectories. So um, I, I'm not sure if anyone here was in the room here has an answer for how we're going to go back. And I think DHET has to be held accountable here or councils. And I, I, again, how when councils are now dominated by people that have no cultural orientation towards universities, they have mm. business orientations. Mm. So, but that's my view. My view is if you want to take, oh, and then don't cry. Don't cry. I don't. I don't. I don't defend black women academics in power easily anymore. I, don't cry to us. Don't cry that you're a victim. Don't do that. We're not coming for you. We're focusing on our little business. Take the bullets now. Sure. Um, <laughs> my my other pet peeve is the is the way to become a vice chancellor these days. Somebody's going to kill me for this. Is just go into a science council. You don't need to know anything about the modern university. You can come the route of a science council, not having taught uh, a university class in your life. I completely agree with you, Nomalanga, on this. Adam. Uh, so, colleagues, I, I'm going to boldly answer that I think uh, I think it's weakening. I think Deborah's right. We've got a far wider and, and depth of leadership than we recognize. But a substantive part of that leadership will not become vice chancellors. They don't think it's worth it. They think it would make life difficult. They think it would distract, detract them from the academic project. They think you're caught in between on the one hand, the violence, the political shenanigans of the unions, the student parties, the politicians, and on the other hand, the strictures of, of, of for want of another term, neoliberalism, the quantitative character of how you measure progress, and you're caught in that bind. And so a last, large amount of them will say, uh -uh, we're not in this game. Uh, so I think we've got a wider layer, and that does mean it opens up the gap for all kinds of people. Uh, for whom, Nomalang is right, the project is not uh, the academic project. The project is uh, either how to make money uh, or the project is how to run an institution in quantitative terms uh, and, and make it a, a kind of factory of production uh, of workers of one kind or the other. And I, so I think we are, I think that the leadership, uh, the answer to this is not some uh, training program Mm -hmm. for a new generation of vice chancellors. We're gonna to have to deal with the structural uh, challenges around this. And I think that's the big, big issue that we've got to, we've got to kind of confront. And I think that's the real thing we, 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 we got to deal with. I, I, there's a lot, wonderful comment uh, that Michael Kahn's put in. And it's got, and it touches on what uh, um, um, Salim put, said in the end. Salim provocatively said uh, that Rhodes made a choice to insource workers, but the cost of it implicitly was its academics were paid less. Yeah. Whereas he uses the example of uh, UCT having made uh, a different choice. Um, uh, the interesting thing that uh, Michael Kahn puts in his, in his post, and, and I think this is right, is that he says, we have the poverty and immiseration here. We have all of these challenges here, but actually our academic class, including our vice chancellors in South Africa, are one of the best paid in the developing world. That's true. And that we got to kind of figure out where the trade-offs are. You're not going to get a more socially just, given the, the scarcity of resources, you're not going to get a more socially just university environment without grappling that everybody else is going to give up something. And where the trade-offs are, how do you structure that social pact? I'm not so sure that we have, have been able to have that post-colonial conversation uh, in this regard. Other colonies, post-colonies did. 
uh, Nomalanga will tell you about Tanzania and how they made their choices and, and uh, in, in, the, uh, in the immediate aftermath. We've made other choices and we are in a different world order. But I do think that that's something we're going to have to talk about. Yeah. Okay. I, uh, uh, can I just ask the rest of you to pause for a minute? Because I just want to read some of the other comments. Uh, uh, you've heard Adam reflect on Michael uh, Michael's uh, point, so I, I, we don't need to go there. Rasigan Maharaj makes a very interesting point uh, with Sakos, Sakos language, you know, that you can't really have a normal university in an abnormal society, and therefore you need to do this analysis you know, of, of, of this not being a special institution, it's simply one kind of institution in the broad sense that is all, uh, uh, you know, uh, the subject of capture and corruption and so on and so forth. Now, as Salim said, there are distinctives to the university, the kinds of resources, but Rasikan seems to me to make a really good point. Then Linda Chisholm, whom you all know, talks about the rollover of senates, which I think is a crucial point to talk about, is how senates gave up their own voice. You know, uh, and, and I mean, dare I say, you've seen some of that uh, rebounding now at UCT, where the Senate starts to say, but no, we do have a say in the academic project, its integrity, and so on and so forth, and we will make our voices heard. But in many of these institutions, one of the, the, the byproducts of corruption is the silencing of the Senate. Uh, 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 Salim and Temba, in that order, could you comment on either any of these? these two comments? So Jonathan, I'm thinking a lot uh, today, and I've said this at recent uh, keynotes and workshops and so on, about the words complicity and Senate. Because I think we where we are is because Senates have either by acts of commission or omission not been guardians of the academic project. There's no laws that I read that give the vice chancellor or the corporate leadership, the powers that they have, as unchecked as they seem to be. And those who sit on senates, I'm talking about senates that have not been hollowed out in the name of democracy, right? And been filled with all kinds of constituencies who are not able to safeguard the academic project. I'm talking about senates where senators are still professors, heads of departments, and so on, right? So, you, you know, you and I can give many concrete examples of what this Senate has done, that Senate has done. The collusion in Senates around certain things of appointments of who is being appointed, the silence when you know that is not a suitable candidate, left-wing people complicit because of what they think they're going to get because of this new DVC or this new VC and the deals that have been struck and so on. It's disgusting to see those kinds of things. Right. Mm -hmm. The Senates are powerful bodies in my understanding, my knowledge of governance in South Africa. They simply have not played the roles that they should have. Why is a very interesting question. Right. And for example, I have made a proposal recently and I continue to make this proposal. If I were to come back to uh, Rhodes again today, what would I do differently? It's a chapter for Zeleza, right? a Kodesia book that's coming out to say, reflect on your vice chancellorship and what would you do different? I might seriously, with all the problems of dual power, suggest for me as a vice chancellor that Senate is going to be chaired by a senior academic elected by Senate and not by the vice chancellor. And that the vice chancellor shall be accountable to Senate in the most accountable ways and no longer see Senate as his playground. You and I know how to structure Senate agendas to get our ways and so on. You know, we know we'll deal with the, the last uh, most important issue at 6 p.m. on a Friday afternoon, when all the people have gone off and we are left uh, as a small cabal and so on. We know how to all do it. We come from the liberation movement. We did those things also, maybe to our shame, right? So unless Senate start to take power back away from the corporate leadership, Senates are collusive in this corporatization of the university. And sometimes academics, have, I'm afraid to be saying, bought off as part of these things. Right. So please, can we fix the senates of our universities so they start to function of senates and as academic guardians? Yeah, absolutely. I hate to be technical. You would, of course, have to get around your statute, but but that's not insurmountable. Sure. Um, uh, Temba, I'm going to give you the last word, and then I'm going to ask our, our head of ASIF, um, Professor Himna Sudil, to 
to wish us well, uh, Timber. Thank you, thank you. Uh, I mean, uh, you know, Jonathan, the Senate, uh, it's true that uh, our Senates are, are no longer what they're supposed to be. In those early debates that we had, you know, leaning towards the white paper, and, uh, and of course the act as, as it was constructed and, and the enormous work that was done by the CHA at the beginning to actually lift the academic project of integrity and all of that. We don't see that now. Um, and, and yes, uh, the, the, the vice chancellor, the chairman of Senate, you can't change that until you change the act, but, but the, the, we just see that Senate being marginalized and, and Senate is happy to be marginalized. And, and you look at the agenda, very technical things, nothing of any intellectual discourse that, that you will find in many Senates. And uh, you know, I chaired the CHE for, for a long time. But before that, you know, Salim will know when, when the CHE started and, and the work there the kinds of programs and frameworks that we put for audits and accreditation and all of that. Now, it is now a tick box exercise. You, you don't see when you visit institutions that uh, these synods are, are the powerful bodies that they're supposed to be. And, and you, you have the composition as we have it. And that's one of the things that we need to, to look into. We know that Mukhalapuru uh, Mahova you know, cause all kinds of stares at the uh, UKZ and around Senate and who sits on Senate. But uh, we, we really need to rethink as, as, as academics, how Senate can reclaim their, their, their positions in, in the intellectual discourse in this country. Okay. Absolutely. Uh, professors uh, Makize, Musia, um, uh, Benat and Habib, thank you very, very much. Uh, over to you, Imra. Mute. Thank you, ah. Jonathan. And uh, I, this being the first of the big, we have set the agenda for what the Academy is all about. It is about uh, discussing issues uh, in the immediate uh, environment in which we placed, getting the top people to, to have these sorts of discussions and lure us into more challenging uh, debates. Uh, while I appreciate that uh, Prof. Muskize was a bit upset that we're doing this in a virtual modality, uh, we would never be able to uh, address issues with such uh, swiftness uh, had we not uh, had the experience of going through the virtual modes of engagement. We take the point, and I hope that through ASAF, we can in the near future host something face-to-face uh, where we address these challenges that we are experiencing in, in academia. So thank you all and to all the participants who stays, stayed on to listen to us at the end and to my colleagues at ASAP for all the hard work behind the scenes. Thank you all so much. Have a good day forward. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you, Prof.